For the second year in a row, the defending NBA champions drafted a player out of Gonzaga. But if you were watching on ESPN, there's about a 0% chance you heard about it. You are Locked On Zags, your daily podcast on the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, y'all? Happy Thursday or happy Friday, depending when you're listening to this. Welcome into the Locked On Zags podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host and longtime Gonzaga podcaster, Andy Patton, here to bring you news and updates on all things Zag athletics. Today's episode of Locked On Zags is brought to you by Game Time. Folks, download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On College for $20 off your first purchase. Terms do apply. Anton Watson is headed to the Boston Celtics playing for the defending NBA champions. We'll talk about that. We're also going to talk about how the NBA draft impacted the other current Zags in the NBA. There's 10 of them. We're going to talk about five of them in the second segment, five of them in the third segment, talk about the players, those teams drafted, whether it could impact those Zags going forward this offseason. But we start the show with the big news. Those of you on YouTube repping the Boston Celtics jersey, it is a Kelly Olynyk jersey from about a decade ago. That is the last time the Boston Celtics selected a player out of Gonzaga University until today, Thursday, June 27th, 54th overall selection in the 2024 NBA draft. Anton Watson goes to the Boston Celtics. It is the fourth straight year a Gonzaga player was selected. That is a program record. They've had three years in a, three years in a row before this. The first time four consecutive years yielded a Gonzaga player getting selected back in 2021. It was Jalen Suggs and Corey Kispert and Philip Petrusev in 2022. It was Chet Holmgren and Andrew Nemhard in 2023. Last year, of course, it was Julian Strother. And this year, right before the draft is over with four picks left, it is Anton Watson. And if you were watching the draft, you're somebody who is following along in real time, you know that heading into the draft, pretty much all day, from this, the moment the draft started, right up until pick 55, the conversation happening on ESPN was about Bronny James. Bronny James did ultimately end up going 55th to the Los Angeles Lakers. It was very obvious that's what was going to happen. They even mentioned on the broadcast that uh, Rich Paul, the, the agent for both LeBron and Bronny James, was in fact uh, telling teams not to draft Bronny until he got to 55. That was the plan all along was to get him to the Lakers at 55. And unfortunately, because that was the driving narrative all day long, whoever got picked 54th was, was probably not going to get a whole lot of attention. And that was the case here. They literally just said, they didn't even say Anton. They said Antoine Watson moved on. Every other prospect got some level of co coverage, whether it was a, a short highlight package, Jonathan Gavoni or Adrian Wojnarowski or somebody talking about the player, their fit with the team, whatever. Anton Watson didn't get any of that. Neither did Kevin McCullough, who went 56th out of Kansas to the New York Knicks. He got virtually no coverage. 57, 58 were both international guys who got still got more coverage than Anton Watson, who just happened to be, Watson and McCullough happened to be in a situation where they got literally no coverage. Now, this doesn't really bother me that much because it's not like ESPN was hammering out super good, knowledgeable information about anybody in the second round. They just weren't. They just weren't. Jonathan Mobo was the first player picked in the second round, and they didn't really know what to do with Jonathan Mobo. They had a few conversations about him, but it's just this wasn't the spot for it. We could have a larger conversation some other time about splitting the NBA draft into two rounds. It, it, I don't think it worked very well. I don't think the conversations they had today uh, on Thursday in the second round were particularly productive. They had Woe John. They had a former general manager from the Boston or from the Golden State Warriors on Myers. They had Stephen A. Smith on, and it just it just never really provided a lot of what I thought was quality draft analysis. And so if you're somebody who was super pissed that they didn't talk about Anton Watson, they wouldn't have had a whole lot of, of particularly interesting stuff to say had there, there not been the Bronny James situation of it all anyway. So it doesn't bother me much. I also will candidly admit that articles I've written about Anton Watson and conversations I've had in the past, including the most recent episode of Locked on Zags, where I talked about uh, 
where I talked with Rowan Kent of No Ceilings NBA about Anton Watson, they have blown up because Boston Celtics fans would like to learn about their newest player and were unable to do so during the actual draft. So they're searching out other ways to find it. So selfishly, doesn't really bother me that there wasn't a whole lot of information during the draft about Anton Watson. For most of you listening, you probably already know a whole heck of a lot about Anton Watson as well. So it's just one of those things that, yeah, it's frustrating. But it's not like this is new for ESPN to focus on, you know, two or three specific stories. In this case, it was really just one with Bronny James and not talking about other things. But that's enough for us talking about Bronny James. Let's focus on Anton Watson because he heads to Boston, a very complete team, a team that is coming off of their 18th NBA Finals championship, the most in basketball history. They are the most prolific NBA franchise. 18 titles. They broke a tie with the Los Angeles Lakers this past season on the back of forwards in Jason Tatum, in Jalen Brown. Big man Chris Stapps Porzingis had a big impact for this team throughout this process. There is a lot of depth in the front court and on the wing for this Boston team. But I don't think the Celtics draft a fifth-year senior one of the oldest players in the draft, if they don't have some vision of him contributing to this team in a sh- in, in short order. If Boston was use, wanted to use this draft pick to just, if they, if they didn't envision using this draft pick in any capacity in the next season or two, they would have drafted one of the 19-year-old international kids, the guys who went 57th and 58th, Ulrich Chamchi and Ariel Huckporty, two guys who were are young bigs, who I think they're both 6'11", 7 foot, Uh, They're both international guys. They're probably going to be stash candidates who don't even come over to the United States until a future season. If Boston wanted to go that route, nobody would blame them because they already have a pretty complete roster. But they went with one of the oldest players, one of the most NBA-ready players in this class. To me, that's what winning teams do. Winning teams draft winning players. Anton Watson is a winning player. He, again, if you listened to uh, Wednesday's episode of Locked on Zags, he's the skeleton key. He can do a little bit of everything. He can help you unlock whatever needs to be unlocked. If you need more perimeter defense, he's got it. If you need more low post defense or rebounding, he's got it. If you need an offensive player who can score around the rim, he's got it. If you need a connecting big who can make good passes, who doesn't turn the ball over, he's got it. The floor spacing, eh, if you're going to rely on Anton Watson to be primarily a three-point shooter, that's a bit... Uh, it's maybe skeptical on that. He shot 41% last year from three, but it was basically five more makes than the previous year where he shot 33% because the volume was so small. The actual improvement in his percentage is a little bit of a red herring in the sense that he didn't take a bunch more threes. He only just made a handful more. I think Anton Watson can be a capable catch and shoot three pointer in the NBA. If you, if he's on the, if he's on the the wing or on the, in the corner and the ball gets swung around to him, which is something Boston likes to do a lot. They go at defenders. This is what they did to Dallas. They drove right at those big men and then kicked it out to shooters and forced the big men for Dallas, Daniel Gafford and Derek Lively to space the floor, to move away from the, the paint and to get out on shooters. If Boston wants Anton Watson to stand in the corner, catch the ball and shoot threes, I think he'll do fine at it. I think he'd be capable of filling that role and being productive on the defensive end of the floor. Having said all of that, players who are picked 54th in the NBA draft typically don't have rotation roles right away in the NBA. The odds of Anton Watson contributing a a consistent, in any kind of consistent role for Boston next year are very low. It has nothing to do with Anton necessarily. It's just a a deep team that, that doesn't necessarily need him. He's more of injury insurance, a guy that we can rely on to come in and contribute if we need him to. I suspect Boston is identifying him as a potential two-way contract. Doesn't mean he's guaranteed to get a two-way contract. They could give him to somebody else uh, and just and, and cut him or put him in the G League without an actual contract. They could give him a full contract and put somebody else in the two-way deal. Like There's a lot of options, and it's going to depend on how he performs in Summer League, which is coming up in early July. We'll talk more about that as we get in to the Summer League season, but I don't think Boston takes if, – if Boston was drafting a player that they just they just needed to use the pick and they wanted to draft somebody who they didn't really think was going to be a contributor, they, like I said, they would have drafted a younger kid. Drafting a 23-year-old, one of the older, more experienced players in this class, tells me that Boston has a real vision for him contributing, at least as an end-of-the-bench guy this season. A two-way deal where he plays in the G League and spends some time in the NBA, learning the ropes, learning from the veteran guys on that team, getting opportunity in garbage time. That makes a lot of sense to me. 
If he does well in that role, he can expand on it. He can get more minutes. If he does well in that role and Boston suffers injuries in the front court and they need to rely on him a little bit more, he will be familiar with the system, familiar with the coaching staff, familiar with his teammates, and ready to step into that role. I think that's more or less where Boston is at with Anton. And I'll say this here before we move on to this topic. We'll talk more about Anton as we get into summer league, but how can you not be so happy for this kid? Spokane kid from Gonzaga Prep, stayed home, stayed loyal to Spokane, always wanted to play at Gonzaga, spent five years playing for the Zags without getting an opportunity for four of those years to really be featured on offense. Plays behind Drew Timmy, plays behind Corey Kisford, behind Philip Petrusev, behind Chet Holmgren. And then last season finally gets the opportunity to open up his game offensively and thrives. When Gonzaga desperately needs somebody to step up offensively to beat UCLA and not take a second loss in the Maui Invitational, Anton Watson drops 35 points. Watson was unfortunately unable to lead them to a victory over Santa Clara in that game in Santa Clara in early January, but he did everything that he could with 35 in that one too. He was a winning player, a, a true zag in the sense that he always wanted to be in this system. He always wanted to play for this team. He stuck it out for five years when he wasn't getting the role that he knew he was capable of filling, got that opportunity, took advantage of it, and now finds himself selected in the NBA draft. It's a beautiful, poetic, fantastic story, a true Gonzaga origin story, one of Mark Few's best stories in a rich history of, of prolific player development in Spokane. And I'm incredibly excited to see what's next for Anton Watson. We're going to move on now. We're going to talk about how the current NBA players who are from Gonzaga were impacted by this draft. We got five guys we're going to talk about in the second segment. None of these guys are likely to move on from the team they're currently on, but we're going to talk about if their role might shift with the new players joining that team. And we're going to talk about that in just a second. Right after I tell you all about today's sponsored game time, folks. Minor league baseball season is here. It's the summer months. And as somebody who lives about 10 minutes away from the Hillsborough Hop Stadium, I love being able to make last minute decisions to head out to the ballpark and catch a game. And that's why I use game time because the prices on the game time app actually get lower the closer you get to first pitch. And with killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat, and their lowest price guarantee, game time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets. And if you're somebody who often worries about tickets being bogus, GameTime's ticketing coverage is perfect because it has the most flexible customer service policy in the entire ticketing industry. Personally, I love having that peace of mind. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with GameTime. Download the GameTime app now, create an account, and use code LOCKEDONCOLLEGE, and you'll get $20 off your first purchase. Folks, you can go down to a hops game and get two tickets for $25. Bucks. Use GameTime. It's two tickets for five bucks, it's less than a beer, less than a hot dog at the stadium. So create an account, redeem code Locked On College for $20 off your first purchase. Terms do apply. Download the GameTime app today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices, guaranteed. All right, folks, segment two, still any patents, still Locked On Zags podcast. We're still talking NBA draft here on a Thursday edition of the Locked On Zags podcast. We talked to Anton Watson getting selected 54th overall, what it means for him, what it means for Boston, what it means for Gonzaga. But now what I want to do is talk about the 10 Zags who are currently in the NBA and how this draft may or may not impact their roles. Here in the second segment, we're talking about a group of guys who they're not on the move. They're not their role's less likely to be impacted. We'll close out the show with guys who might have some more shifts, but here we're talking Chet, we're talking Nemhard, we're talking Suggs, Sabonis, and Julian Strother, all guys who are pretty locked in where they are. We'll start with Chet. Oklahoma City, number one seed in the West last year, a team that has a ton of depth, a ton of talent, already made a big move this offseason, trading Josh Giddy for Alex Caruso. Uh, they drafted, they, they picked four players in this draft, which is a little surprising for a team that had as much depth and kind of as much talent already on the roster. They draft Nikola Topic uh, from Serbia. He's going to be out for the entire year with an injury. That makes that pick make a little bit more sense for them. They take Dylan Jones from Weber State, one of the best mid-major players in this class. They take another great mid-major player, point guard A.J. Mitchell out of Santa Barbara. And then they take Quentin Post, a seven-footer from Boston College, late in the second round. Chet's not – nothing's changing with Chet. There's no point in even – pretending to discuss that. Chet's going to have the same role he had last year. He's going to be a, an all-star candidate, an all-NBA candidate, a defensive player of the year candidate. He's going to do all the things that we know Chet Holmgren's going to do. None of these players challenge Chet even remotely for playing time. The only one who even plays the same position is Quentin Post, who is is might not make the roster. 
I like Quentin Post. He was good at Boston College. He's a seven-footer who shot 43% from three last year. So he might do for some good mentoring from Chet. Chet might be able to help him kind of find that role, even though Quentin Post, by the way, older than Chet Holmgren. That's how crazy young Chet still is at this point. But uh, yeah, Oklahoma City is going to look a lot very similar to what they did last year. Uh, I like this class for them, but it's not going to impact Chet's playing time in the short term or long term, really. Next up, Andrew Nemhart, Indiana Pacers. Nemhart wouldn't have been in this lock category, uh, but he had such a dominant performance in the Eastern Conference playoffs this past year that he is now cemented in as the starting point guard for Indiana, one of their best kind of core young pieces. This team already has a ton of guard depth with him, with Tyrese Halliburton, with Ben Matherin out of Arizona, who missed a lot of last year with an injury. He's going to be back and healthy. So there's a ton of guards already taking up spots in Indiana, which is why their draft was a little confusing to me. Perhaps Tony East, the host of Locked On Pacers, can, can lay it out a little bit smoother for me sometime. They drafted Johnny Furphy, who's not a guard. He's a six foot eight wing out of Australia, uh, out of Kansas directly, but from Australia. He's not going to play the one or the two. He's going to play the three, maybe small ball four. He's a great shooter. He offers some more spacing for Nemhard and Halliburton to operate. They also draft Tristan Newton, back-to-back national champion Tristan Newton for the UConn Huskies, most outstanding player in the most recent NCAA tournament, a terrific, terrific, versatile point guard. Again, if Nemhard hadn't done what he just did, I think there might be a little bit more of like, oh, does this challenge Nemhard's playing time? But no, I don't think that it does. Newton is an older prospect. He's he's very good. He was a very good college player, and I think he can be an NBA player, but I see him as like a third string point guard, maybe in a pinch, your second string backup point guard, but he's not going to challenge Nemhard for playing time. I think those two guys are going to play well off of each other, and I think that it's going to be good competition in practice. Every time Andrew Nemhard's they're they're running sets in practice and Tristan Newton's the one up guarding him. I think that's going to make Nemhard better, but I don't think he's going to challenge him for significant playing time. Next up, Jalen Suggs for Orlando. Orlando only used one pick in this draft. They took Tristan De Silva out of Colorado. De Silva's a six foot nine forward. Obviously, doesn't compete with Jalen Suggs whatsoever. It does give Colorado, or excuse me, Orlando, more floor spacing, which is good for Jalen Suggs, who had the best season of his NBA career last year. Shot it really well from deep, uh, but Suggs is still a head down drive to the basket type score. That's what he likes to do. The best way to get your guards the opportunity to drive to the rim and score is to put floor spacers around them. Tristan Da Silva is that for Orlando. So this is a positive move for them. Moving on to Sacramento, DeMontis Sabonis, Gonzaga's all-star, all-NBA caliber player. Really, really tremendous season last year for the Kings. Kings only made one pick as well, and they took a point guard in Devin Carter. I know a lot of Sacramento fans were not particularly happy about this pick because of the the depth that Sacramento has. They did sent they since traded Davion Mitchell, which I think helps clear up some of that uh, backcourt log jam that they have. But Devin Carter, he's a point guard, sure, but he's six foot eight. He averaged like ten rebounds a game last year in the Big East. Like he is a wing who also can happen to play the point guard position. He thrives in an off-ball role. He doesn't need the ball in his hands a lot to succeed. That's good for Sacramento because Sacramento loves to have the ball in either De'Aaron Fox or DeMontis Sabonis' hands. So having floor-spacing wings like Devin Carter, who can cut to the rim, who can rebound their position well, who can shoot threes, that's the kind of player you want to put around a a two-man combo of Fox and Sabonis. So I think Carter's a really nice fit in Sacramento. And then closing out this segment... We'll talk Julian Strother. The other four guys are very locked into their roster. I think Strother is too, less so because of his performance. He didn't play all that much last year, had some injuries, just wasn't a part of that rotation for a deep Denver squad. But the Nuggets only drafted him a year ago. They're not getting rid of him. They, they like him. They, I don't think I don't think Strother's going anywhere because I think that Denver's invested in his continued growth and development. And they didn't do anything in this draft that would jeopardize that. They used one pick in the NBA draft to take a center out of Dayton and Deron Holmes. I really like Deron Holmes. And I think as a backup to Nikola Jokic, this is a really nice fit for Holmes in Denver, but it means nothing for Julian Strother. Denver already has a lot of wing depth. They already have Peyton Watson. They already have Christian Braun. They have Hunter Tyson. They're probably going to lose Contavious Caldwell-Pope to free agency. That could clear up more playing time for Strother to step up. I do expect him to play more next year. I expect to see him improved from what he was last year. I think we're going to see a, a, a 
a more confident, more prepared for the NBA Julian Strother next season. I don't think he's going to be a huge contributor. I play 20 plus minutes a night necessarily, but I think he will be a more visible piece for Denver next year. And they didn't attack this draft in a way where they thought that the two or the three were areas of need, which I think is a good indication of, of how they perceive Strother and his future value to this organization. Well, now I want to talk about the guys who maybe are not going to be on the team that they're currently on. We're going to talk about Corey Kispert and Rui Hachimura. Are they trade candidates out of Washington and L.A.? We're also going to talk about whether Brandon Clark can coexist with Zach Eady in Memphis's new look front court. All that coming up in just a second. All right, folks. Segment three, still any patents, still locked on Zach's podcast. And we're still going through our conversation talking about all 10 former Gonzaga players in the NBA, 11 now. If you count Anton Watson, getting getting drafted by the Boston Celtics, talked about that to lead off the show. Also talked about five Zags in the NBA who probably aren't going to see their role dramatically altered by how this draft went on Wednesday and Thursday. But I want to close out the show talking about guys who maybe, maybe are on the move, or at least maybe saw their role impacted a little bit more by how the draft went. The two players in particular, and then we'll kind of close out with three other guys, our Corey Kispert for the Washington Wizards and Rui Hachimura for the Los Angeles Lakers. We'll start in the nation's capital, D.C., with Corey Kispert. The Wizards made three picks in the first round of the NBA draft. They took Alex Saar, number two overall. He's a seven-footer, about seven-footer. He's a Frenchman. He's an elite defensive prospect. Doesn't really compete with Corey Kispert. They took Bub Carrington, 14th overall. I really like Carrington. He was the point guard at Pitt last year. One of the youngest players in the draft class, which is great for a rebuilding team like Washington. He is a peer point guard, so again, doesn't really compete with Corey Kispert. Their third and final pick in the first round was Keyshawn George from Miami. George is a six foot eight wing who shoots the three ball well. That is more of a competition for Corey Kispert. But I think the notable thing here is that Washington made a trade. They traded Denny Avija to the Portland Trailblazers, 23 year old wing, exciting young player. This is a great move for Portland. For Washington, they're getting out of his contract, which wasn't a huge contract, but they get a bunch of second round picks from the Portland Trailblazers. They also get Malcolm Brogdon as a salary match. They're likely going to, well, not likely, almost certainly going to flip Brogdon uh, for more draft capital in the future. But Denny was competing with Corey in, for minutes at the three. So they bring in Keyshawn George, but he's a rookie from Miami. He's more of a guard than Kispert is. Kispert's more of a forward. George is six foot eight, but he's a lot skinnier. He plays more like a point guard. So they're not super competitive. So Washington has plenty of room to give Corey Kispert a 30 minute per, per game role next year, like he had this past year, and let him go off. But they also might trade him because they're looking to consolidate talent. They're looking to get even younger. And Kispert's not old, but he's also not young by NBA standards anymore. And he's not a part of their future because he's only got one year left on his contract. One year, $5.7 million. For a guy who proved last year he's one of the most prolific two-point scorers in the NBA, which surprises a lot of people, he's a dead-eye three-point shooter. He's a movement shooter who can move without the basketball, doesn't need the ball in his hands. He's an adequate defender. He's not great on that end of the floor. We're not going to pretend that he is, but he's adequate. And if you can get a guy who can score as well as Kispert, who can move without the ball, who can attack closeouts, who's a lights-out shooter for $6 million bucks. That he is a he is a highly valuable commodity on the trade market. And Washington would at this point, frankly, be stupid to not look to deal him for whatever they can get. If they can get a first round pick and a couple future seconds, first round pick and a young player to salary match, whatever it is, Washington should be looking for that. For Kispert, I hope he lands in a place where he can win some games. He doesn't have that opportunity in Washington. I don't really care where it is. I want him to go somewhere that he wants to be, that wants to have him. That seems like a good win. There are plenty of teams out there that could utilize a movement shooter like Corey Kispert. In fact, I'd say the Lakers are one of those teams had they not drafted Dalton Connect, who is frankly very similar to Corey Kispert at this point. But there are plenty of other teams out there who could use a guy like Kispert. Maybe if the Clippers end up moving on from Paul George, maybe Kispert, he's not a full replacement for Paul George. I don't want to imply that, but they could use some more scoring at that point. Kispert could come in and, and bring that for them. So very interested to see what, if anything, happens with Corey Kispert this offseason. Now let's talk Lakers. Rui Hachimura still got two years, about $35 million left on his contract with the Lakers. That is the perfect deal to move as a salary match. It makes a lot of sense that the Lakers would move, look to move Rui. For, they got to re-sign LeBron, but they just drafted Bronny James, so they're going to re-sign LeBron. That's the whole reason that all of that happened. So the Lakers are going to get Bronny James back. 
They drafted Dalton Connect, who is a fantastic movement shooter, who is a fantastic scorer, who's a veteran guy who's going to help them right away on the wing. Rui was playing more big. He was playing four. He's playing a little bit of five. So he's not really a competitor with Connect necessarily, but I still think the Lakers may look to move Rui. Um, Rui and picks to consolidate talent and, and bring in, uh, so if they can get a bigger name to come in to help contribute the, to this team, I think they're going to try to do that. So I'm watching closely. I also know that LeBron and Anthony Davis both really liked playing with Rui. They said a lot of complimentary things about the skills that he brought to that roster. So I don't think it's a guarantee that he's going to get traded. But it's certainly one that I'm watching closely because I would not be surprised if the Lakers try to bring in some star power this offseason and if Rui's contract is used to help match those salaries. Three more guys to talk about. Zach Collins with the San Antonio Spurs. The Spurs had a very active draft. They took Stefan Castle, number four overall, the freshman guard out of Yukon. They took Juan Nunez, a Spanish guard, in the second round, and then they rounded out their draft class, taking North Carolina forward Harrison Ingram in the middle of the second round. None of this really impacts Collins. Collins is going to play a valuable role uh, as a big man alongside Victor Weminyama. Greg Popovich really likes Collins. He's going to continue to play. He didn't have a great year last year. He was better the previous year. Last year, his efficiency numbers were not great. Uh, hopefully, he can rebound and have a better, more productive season this year with the with the Spurs. Harrison Ingram is a, is somewhat similar to Collins in the sense that he is a, a big man who spaces the floor, but Ingram is about 6'8", whereas Collins is 6'10", 6'11". Ingram is more like a point forward. Collins is not that. Collins is also a rim protector, at least a rebounder, whereas Ingram, I'm not sure he's going to bring that. So none of this really challenges Zach Collins' role in San Antonio. I think it's going to look very similar going forward. Next up, one talk, Kelly Olenek, the old head, the veteran of the Zags in the NBA, playing for the Toronto Raptors, his hometown, his home country. And I like Toronto's draft a lot. I don't think it impacts Kelly in the short term, maybe in the long term, but Kelly's long-term prospects in the NBA are not super high because he's a veteran guy. He's probably not going to play a whole lot. He's probably not going to play many more years in the NBA at this point. Toronto used a first-round pick on Jacoby Walter, a shooting guard from Baylor. They used three second-round picks, first on Jonathan Mobo from San Francisco. We'll talk about that. They also took Jamal Shedd, the point guard for Houston, and a big man from the NBA Africa Academy, Ulrich Chomchi. Kelly Linux not threatened immediately by Mobo or Chomchi. Chomchi may not even come over. He may stay overseas. If he does come over, he's not going to be a player who uh, is, is competing for minutes right away for Toronto, even a rebuilding team like the Raptors. Mobo is probably going to play right away, though. I think Toronto identified Mobo as somebody they want to bring in to contribute to this team immediately. Now, Mobo is 6'6 without shoes. He's got a 6'10 wingspan, but he's more of a four, maybe a very, very small ball five. Mobo has no outside shot whatsoever, so Olenek is, is a bigger player, a stronger player, obviously a much more veteran player, and a good three-point shooter. Mobo does have connecting ability. He's a great passer, and I think using him in a similar role to Kelly in the sense of getting the ball at the top of the key, making reads, hitting backdoor cutters, pulling defenders away from the rim, like those are things that both Mobo and Olenek are going to be able to offer. But I don't think that like, – certainly Mobo is not going to take minutes away from Kelly. If that were to happen, uh, Kelly would probably be on his way out. He'd be getting traded or he'd be having a bad season. Like that's not going to happen unless something changes in that situation. I think Olenek's a potential good mentor for Jonathan Mobo, and I think them both coming from the WCC is not going to hurt the opportunity for them to get to know each other and, and potentially kind of have that mentor-mentee relationship because I think the one thing Mobo cannot do at this point is shoot from the, from the outside. If Kelly can help him develop even a semblance of an outside shot, Mobo goes from a guy who's maybe going to stick in the NBA to, hey, that guy's a lock to be in the, in the league for five to eight years. And I think if Kelly can help Mobo get there, that'd be a great kind of send-off to his career as an NBA player and uh, in his hometown of Toronto. Last but not least, Brandon Clark, Memphis Grizzlies, missed most of last year with an injury, got healthy towards the end of the year, and now he sees what is likely his starting job diminish slash gone after Memphis used the ninth pick in the NBA draft to take Zach Eady out of Purdue. Obviously, everybody knows Zach Eady. We all knew he was going to get drafted. Not very many people thought he was going to be a first or a top 10 pick, a top, a lottery pick. He goes to Memphis at number nine. Memphis is identifying Edie as somebody they think can play alongside Jaron Jackson Jr. They're starting power forward. Both those guys are very good defensive players. Edie more so for his size, although he does move laterally very, pretty well. He is going to be an impactful rim protector in the next level. 
Jaron Jackson Jr. is fantastic defensively. Uh, this floor spacing is a mess with those two guys. Brandon Clark is also not a floor spacing big, so I'm very intrigued how this is going to work in Memphis. Uh, I think that John ja Morant and Zach Eady plays well together because Eady cleans up messes at the rim. I think he's going to help out a lot in that regard, but I do think Brandon Clark comes off the bench. I think Memphis kind of identified him as somebody who they want to come off the bench anyway, but they sent him to a huge $66 million deal not that long ago. He missed off last year with an injury. It's unfortunate that, frankly, his playing time may be or is almost certainly going to be impacted negatively by Zach Eady coming to Memphis. We'll see if Clark continues to be a part of the future in Memphis if they look to trade him. I don't know that a lot of teams are chomping at the bit to go pay a player 50 plus million dollars who missed most of last year with an injury, who doesn't space the floor, but. Uh, I, Clark can, can be an impactful NBA player. There's no doubt about that. He has been an impactful NBA player up to this point, but the fit in Memphis is no longer as secure as it was previously with Zach Eady on board. It's going to wrap it up for me today here on the Locked On Zags podcast, folks. I will be back on Friday talking about the what looks like the death of the Maui Invitational, or at least it took a big hit with a couple teams opting out to go play in that Players Era Invitational with Gonzaga in 2025. We'll talk about that. we got some other fun stuff to chat about on Friday's episode as well. But for now, until then, as always, go Anton Watson and, of course, go Zags.